So good morning. I'm Frank Verastro, and it's my pleasure to welcome here to CSIS. Um, let me start. Before we get started, actually, we have our, our final speaker is at the airport, but she will arrive momentarily, and we'll load her presentation. She was uh, delayed in Boston this morning. Um, administratively, though, uh, the first announcement involves safety. So in addition to my host role today, I'm also your safety officer. So uh, in the event, of, unlikely event of an evacuation, the way you came in is one of the options out the doors behind you, down the stairs, across the street, and we assemble at the park to the right of the Beacon Hotel. Second option is down the stairs, follow the exit signs, takes you to an alleyway behind the building, brings you out on M Street um, by the National Geographic. Second announcement involves today's nationwide day without immigrant strike. So our events here are heavily dependent on immigrant workers, both internal staff and outside contractors. And thank God, you know, Jose and Guillermo um, were here early this morning to make sure everything was set up. Should we experience any inconvenience today, just understand and take it in perspective what the day is all about because disruption is an important piece of this and we value a uh, diverse economy. And then final announcement, this concerns your cell phones, right? So uh, we've got a good sized crowd today. We're also webcasting this and this would be a great time to turn off your cell phone both for our um, speakers and for the people around you. Just as a courtesy matter. And I will keep my eyes peeled for Sarah when she walks in the door. So this morning's session is entitled Road to Market Rebalance. And over the years, this event really has become our annual outlook at what the next year is going to look like uh, for oil and gas and geopolitics. For the last two years now, in commentaries and presentations, Guy, Larry, Kevin, and myself have been consistent in our view that we were in a period of lower for longer. Um, but we're now in a period of rebalance. And the question is, how quickly and what does that look like as it returns? The rebalance is underway. We've learned the hard way that oil prices in excess of $120 don't work. Prices below $27 don't work either. So we've been looking for this kind of Goldilocks equilibrium. The recently announced OPEC and now quasi-implemented OPEC and non-OPEC cuts will contribute to the timing of this rebalance and get rid of the excess oversupply. But the reduction is not, at least today, the 1.7 or 1.8 million barrel a day reduction that's advertised. For example, the 91% compliance figure is tied to a subset of the OPEC members that are actually participating in the rebalance. Um, but notable others remain above quota or without quotas at all. We have now a resilient and a resurgent, and we'll hear about this today, a US outlook. We have enormous inventories, both above and below ground. And we'll talk a little bit today about drill but uncompleted wells. Question about the strength and future consumption, particularly if certain policies around trade, taxation, and sanctions are changed. And then there's the issue of an environmental and societal pushback on fossil fuels generally, but also on infrastructure in particular. And we've also seen that in the first two months of this year. To help bring this complex picture into a better focus, we have an extraordinary panel with you uh, with us today. Uh, they're all veterans of previous CSIS market sessions, and they're going to walk you through the various issues and challenges of what we see ahead for 2017. Their more extensive bios are in your packet, but very briefly, our kickoff speaker this morning is going to be Rusty Brazil. Rusty is president and CEO of RBN Energy. He's one of the go-to guys that we have on oil market gas market and liquids as well, and liquids is going to become increasingly important. Also on infrastructure. He's been a frequent presenter at CSIS and has decades of operational and analytical experience with Texaco, with Williams Companies, with Altra, and he was a co-founder of Bentec. It's always a pleasure to have Rusty with us and glad to see him today. Rusty's presentation will be followed by Dr. Sarah Emerson. Uh, Sarah is currently president of ESAI. She's the managing principal of the petroleum and alternative fuels practice there. She too is a veteran of CSIS panels, but her recent presentation, and Adam can attest to this and Howard, at the EIA conference last fall was so uniquely insightful that we thought we needed to have her back to look at the global perspective. And since aside from direct burn, the primary market for crude use is with refiners, we've asked Kurt Barrow to walk us through the global investment and refinery challenges and what this might mean for future competition, investment, and markets going forward. Kurt is Vice President of Oil Markets, Midstream and Downstream for IHS Energy. 
He's formerly a vice president with Pervin and Gertz and began his career at the Exxon Baytown refinery, so we also have operational experience to go along with it. You will also note that since the initial announcement, we have added a distinguished fourth panelist. And this one begs for a more personalized introduction. For the past five years, I've had the extraordinary privilege of holding the James Schlesinger chair here at CSIS. And it was a chair that was established for Jim, um, who was a mentor and a dear, dear friend. And I actually took the chair with his encouragement and his selection, so it was doubly well. Um, it's rare in this town to voluntarily relinquish that kind of a post. It's rarer still to be able to self-select your <laughs> successor. And in Adam, I gotta tell you, we found the trifecta. So it was a combination of credibility, analytical expertise, and a personality that actually fits well with our group around here. For the past five years, Guy, Sarah, and I have been trying to get Adam to join us here at CSIS. And despite that, he took positions at the White House and then at EIA, and he delayed coming here. But eventually, it was kind of preordained that he was going to join us. I would also add that uh, his first day, and if um, his wife Lori is watching, those of you at EIA would know this, Adam, his second day here brought in baked goods, and the entire seventh floor just fell in love with him. <laughs> so Lori, despite the admonishments from Cheryl and Donna Caruso, Adam is doing really well at his new school. Everyone likes him. <laughs> but keep the baked goods coming. <laughs> I would also like to know that, that in addition to his service, or like you to know, in addition to his service at EIA, Adam was at the National Security Council. He worked as an analyst with Nat West and at Deutsche Bank. He's got terrific experience. And today, for the first time, we are publicly introducing him as the incoming and new James Schlesinger Chair for Energy and Geopolitics and the news member of our CSIS family, which is terrific. So I apologize for the protracted introduction. I promise you, even if we go a bit long, we will still give you ample time for questions at the end. And Sarah has just joined us, so we'll load her presentation. And then we'll uh, look to uh, Rusty to, to come to the podium and start and kick off this event. So thank you very much for coming. Where's my uh, click down button? Yep. Right here? Unless we're loading. Oh, right here. Well, thanks, Frank. I really appreciate you having me uh, back again this year. Um, what a difference a year does make. Um, last time we did this, I don't know if you remember, it was uh, February the 17th of last year. Um, everything was collapsing. Uh, crude oil prices were $30.66 that day. Uh, four days prior, they had been $26.21. Production producers were staring into the abyss. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Rig count was falling to a level we hadn't seen in 30 years. Uh, economics were upside down in pretty much all of the shale plays, and midstream guys were worried about what was going to happen to their volumes uh, and worried about whether they were going to get paid as well. And here we are a year later. And uh, is the, yeah, here we go. A uh, year later, and uh, well, Frank asked me to characterize the mood in my hometown, Houston, Texas, and back in the oil patch as well. So I thought this pretty much did it. <laughs> the mood's pretty good. You can hear the R word used openly and freely in Houston. And for those of you who are not from Houston, the R word is recovery. Producers are smiling again. There he is right there. Um, and we hear that some of those producers are sending engraved notes to OPEC members thanking them for stabilizing prices and for giving up market share. And this is why they're this is why they're happy, right? This is why they're smiling. It's the rig count. They're back to work again. Baker Hughes rig count for the past 14 months or so. Crude oil rig count was down uh, from from 500 down to 300, back up to 591 now. Uh, same story for gas. Uh, was at about 150 down to 80 now, up to 149. 740 rigs running right now. If prices cooperate, there's a reasonably decent chance we'll be back at a thousand rigs running by the end of the year. So it's a recovery, right? Well, hmm. 
Is this what we thought a recovery was going to look like? This is the price of crude oil since the good old days in 2013, 2014, when prices were at 100 bucks. Past two years with prices below 50 bucks, most of the time, 50 dollars or so right now, 53 dollars uh, yesterday or so. Back in 2015, would we have called this a recovery? Absolutely not. We would have called it a meltdown, a catastrophe, or something far worse in Texas. Uh, it's a similar story for gas. Uh, back in 2014, producers were enjoying four bucks or so. Uh, two years later, we're barely above three dollars, two dollars and ninety-three cents yesterday. Is that a recovery? No, I don't think so, at least not the way we would have defined it before. This is a different kind of recovery. This is a market upturn that looks quite a bit different than what we've seen before, and it's driven by something other than price. Now, price is part of it. Uh, this is the same numbers that we looked at before, just from a different perspective. Day prices for gas, NGLs, and, in, and crude oil from 2015, first of the year, until now, uh, on um, uh, the same scale, MMBTU on the left, per barrel on the right. Energy commodity markets hit rock bottom in the first quarter of 2016, to, uh, that 2621 on February the 11th. Gas a buck 74 on March 3rd. NGL 670 on an MMBTU basis on January the 20th. We call that the abyss, and at that point it looked bad for just about everybody. But you can see crude oil started leading things back up, and today the gas price is, or the crude price for crude is more than double uh, what it was uh, uh, back in the middle of the abyss. Gas is up 85%. NGLs are up 135%. Now that does look a little bit like a recovery, but again, prices are only part of that story. I've used a version of this slide, I think, in probably every presentation that I made here at CIS, uh, CSIS. And, uh, uh, the reason I do that is because every time I show it, people ask me, well, when is this going to peak out? When are we going to have achieved kind of maximum additional productivity in this market? My answer to you is we're not there yet. We're not even close. This just says how much uh, uh, of, a, of a either liquids or crude oil is being added by an individual rig each year. It's EIA drilling productivity report. 6.5 times the volume added uh, in the Eagleford uh, since uh, versus 2011, four times in the Bakken, 12 times in the Niobrara, eight times in the Marcellus and Utica. So who knows when this is going to stop. When you look at the trends, when you look at what's going on in these markets, it doesn't look like it's going to stop anytime soon. One of the most important drivers is this what I call just simply the decline curve, or the rise of the decline curve. And uh, that is specifically the issue of more gently declining decline curves. Decline curve is simply uh, uh, how much production comes out of a well over time. Since the beginning of the shale revolution, people have talked about the fact that, gosh, these decline curves are really steep, 60 or 70 percent. And that characteristic of, of the decline of wells looking like that uh, was one of the reasons why a lot of folks were uh, dismissing the whole shale revolution uh, back in the early days, uh, saying that, gosh, anything that declines this quickly, as soon as drilling stops, then production is going to fall off very quickly. But people figured out that, hey, getting a lot of your production out of the well early is actually a good thing for present value economics, not a bad thing, particularly if you start high enough and the initial production rates of these wells did start high enough. And so that actually turned out to be a good thing for economics. But what if, what if you could get those high initial production rates that you get out of shale wells and not see those steep decline curves, instead seeing a decline curve that looks more like that. That's precisely what we've been seeing in the oil patch over the course of the past few months. 30 to 40 percent initial first year decline curves, not 60 to 70 percent decline curves. So what's going on? What could cause this to happen? Well, there's a lot of factors that, uh, that play into this and production engineers and geophysical experts can tell you all about it. I'm not one. But there are four simple things that I can tell you, and I'll base my analysis on Tom T. Hall. 
Now, if you don't know who Tom T. Hall is or know the four things that I'm going to be talking about here, I, I, I would encourage you to Google Tom T. Hall and you can find out just exactly what he's got to say about those four things, which I'm not going to repeat in this audience. But in terms of what's going on with that decline curve, thing number one, larger leaseholds. There are a lot of deals getting done in the oil patch right now. And a lot of these deals are all about producers concentrating their acreage, getting their acreage in one basin where they own a lot of leasehold in one spot. Why would they want to do that? For one thing, it's cheaper to operate that way because you have a lot of your operation in one single area. But more importantly, it allows you because you can now drill longer laterals across that concentrated leasehold ownership. So for example, if I want to drill a two mile lateral, I cannot drill a two mile lateral if my lease only is in a one mile area. I can't drill across somebody else's lease, right? So what have I got to do? I've got to trade my property somewhere else in the lower 40 that I'm not that crazy about, get, a, get some leasehold in my general area so now I can drill those longer laterals and instead of one mile laterals that were common a couple of years ago, now two mile laterals are much more common somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, of, of 10,000 uh, foot laterals and you've got a lot more of that well bore connecting, uh, uh, connected to uh, the the rock formation, a lot more hydrocarbons flowing through that well bore up to the surface, and that's where those big initial production rates are coming from. Extra sand, lots of extra sand. Hold on that thought for a second because I've got another slide on that coming up right after this one. But what that does is it allows me to produce a whole heck of a lot more hydrocarbons given out of a given well. And so what I can do is I can choke back that well. Think of it as like a balloon, holding the neck of a balloon and not letting quite a bit of air out all at the same time. So it basically extends the amount of time that that well produces. That's what causes the decline curve not to fall off as sharply. And also we highly suspect that decline curves in the future will also not fall off as sharply either. The initial, the, 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 uh, the, rate of the rate of return on that green line is a lot better than the rate of return on that brown line up there. And that is the reason why it makes a lot of sense to do this and it's exactly what we see producers are doing right now. Now I said I'm going to talk just a minute about sand. So these days, 10,000 foot laterals, Typical sand down a 10,000 foot lateral somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 million pounds. 15 million pounds uh, in, in a 10,000 foot lateral, just do the math, it is 1,500 pounds of sand per lateral foot. Let's think about what that means. There's about 90 pounds of sand in a, in a, or a, 90, a, a cubic foot of sand is about 90 pounds. So 1,500 pounds of sand is, is about 16 cubic feet of sand. Let's assume each one of those boxes right there is a cubic foot and each is full of sand. We're gonna mix that sand with water and we're gonna stick that, all of that sand and all of that water into a piece of pipe that looks like that. Wow. That's a lot of sand through a little bitty tiny piece of pipe, right? About yay big around, about yay long. And then we're going to squirt that sand out through holes in that pipe and that's going to break up the rock. Two years ago, three years ago, there were like two of those blocks of sand. Now we're up to 16. Everything that's going to be happening in the Permian over the next year or so is going to be 20. That's technology. It's technology. It's know-how. It's understanding how to use this technology to get a heck of a lot more hydrocarbons out of the market, uh, out of the ground, and that is what is in the process of changing our markets right now. So uh, just looking real quickly then at what this road to recovery looks like, uh, that's crude oil production. Uh, uh, maxed out about 9.6 in April of 2015, uh, down to uh, 8.6 in September, back up to as a recovery. Well, you know, uh, basically we're saying we're back up to about 9 million barrels a day now. Uh, so that's an increase of about 300 or so. So we're, we were down, we are down relative to last year, but we're up relative to the 
relative to the first of the year. Natural gas uh, was about 74, now about 71, 70, or 70, 71 or so. That's gonna be coming back too as soon as we get some more pipeline projects being built out of the Northeast. Uh, in terms of the uh, NGL market, NGL market is blowing and going strong, uh, only down about 2% from its peak, uh, double what it was seven or eight years ago. But back to crude, it, crude is down. And so if crude's down, what is that doing to the balance of the market? Well, we're not running any less crude to speak of in terms of refinery runs. So if we're not running any less, then if we're making less, it's got to be balancing somehow, right? Well, it's not the Canadians. Canadians have been about flat for the last two or three years uh, and about th at about 3.2 uh, million barrels a day of imports. It's not everybody else but at OPEC and Canada. That's been about flat, about 1.5 million barrels a day. So there's only one other possibility, right? It's OPEC. So when we don't produce it, OPEC imports it into the United States. That's the balancing mechanism in, in terms of what's going on in the U.S. market. So ironically, the, uh, the, the OPEC agreement allow them to, do, to capture some market share they captured ours. Isn't that an interesting phenomenon? Exports. Boy, on this panel, we've talked a lot about exports, haven't we, Frank? We've, we've, we, uh, we beat this one to death uh, two or three years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Republicans uh, gave up a lot in order to get uh, exports uh, in terms of five years of tax credits on wind and solar. And what did they get? They got 65,000 barrels a day. That's what they got. So uh, back in uh, uh, this year, uh, it's uh, it's about uh, 500 and or, or about uh, 530. Uh, last year it was about 465, so it's about 65 difference. So the important thing to remember about exports is that every time we export a barrel, because we have uh, a, more demand than we have supply, we have to import a barrel to replace it, and that's the way it's always going to work. Flipping over to natural gas. Natural gas production uh, over the course of the uh, last uh, a few, a couple of years, uh, or last year, has been down. Uh, production, you can see in the red line there, is last year. Uh, this year, it's about the same as it's been. Uh, production's been down for a whole variety of things uh, with uh, market dynamics and pipeline constraints contributing to that, down just about to BCF or so. If we look at what the balance looks like for natural gas, um, we can see that uh, total supply was down about 1.6 million barrels a day, or, or 1.6 BCF a day, sorry, I need to change units. Uh, and uh, on the demand side, everything but residential commercial demand is up. So power up, Mexican exports up, LNG deliveries up, industrial up, cumulative demand up 1.1. So you add 1.1 additional demand, 1.9, I went to 1.6 uh, uh, less supply. Uh, the band demand was, uh, the whole balance is 1 point, uh, 2.7 BCF a day tighter in 2016 uh, than it was in 15. So uh, one last thing, um, uh, what does this uh, scenario look like for the future? So what we do at RBN is rather than forecasting prices, we say, well, we don't like our price forecasts all that much and we don't like anybody else's either. So we're gonna pick some scenarios and then based on those scenarios, try to determine what that means for producer behavior, then for production, and then for the implications on infrastructure development. So this time we've uh, selected four cases. We call them advanced growth cutback and contraction. Uh, just in the, uh, just to go through it quickly, the advanced scenario is 80 bucks a barrel uh, in 2020, 2022. Growth is 70. Cutback is 60. Contraction is 50. Natural gas follows the same kind of pattern. Again, these are not forecasts. These are just ways that we can crunch our numbers through the model and tell what's likely to happen uh, over the course of the last, last little bit in terms of production. This is what gas production looks like in that scenario, lower 48 in BCF. Uh, history ramped up about 2.3 BCF every year between 2007 and 2016. In the advanced scenario, 
We've got it going up to 3.8 BCF, 1.1 uh, BCF in the cutback scenario, and uh, about flat going down a little bit uh, in the contraction scenario. Bottom line on that is that we do not have any scenario where natural gas production in the United States declines significantly over the next few years, and it could grow by a heck of a lot. This is one of those scenarios, the growth scenario, showing balances. That's dry gas production and Canadian imports. That is uh, total, uh, 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 total uh, demand uh, coming from uh, industrial uh, exports, residential commercial, LNG, and power. Bottom line on this slide uh, is that if there was, uh, there was not the uh, export demand happening here, about 17 BCF of exports, the market would not balance. In other words, we need those exports in the, in the form of pipeline exports to Mexico and LNG exports uh, to overseas countries in order to balance the market. But there's a flip side to that statement, and that's the current forward curve. If those lev level of exports do happen, then we're going to have to see some healthy growth in natural gas production. For that growth in production to happen, it will not happen, at least in our view, at that current forward curve. So one of two things has to result. Either we'll not see exports at the level uh, I just showed a few minutes ago, about 17 BCF a day, or that forward curve, that red line, has to move up. So similar story for crude oil. Uh, that's the crude, various crude oil for, uh, forecast based on, those production, uh, based on those price scenarios that we just looked at. That gets us up to about uh, 12 million barrels a day in 2022 for the highest case, uh, 600 in what we call the growth case, uh, which is about 10.8 uh, million barrels a day by then, flat in the con contraction scenarios. Uh, again, no scenario where production declines. This is the way the market balances out. The green there at the top is uh, exports. So what that's saying is we don't have any view that exports are going to be increasing by any time soon. Anytime soon, because anything we're going to have to, anything we export, we're going to have to uh, replace in that uh, in that uh, uh, pink area there. And just like we've seen for the last few decades, it's always going to be imports that balance that market, at least here in the United States. One final thought. I showed this one uh, last time I was here, Frank, and it showed what we lived through in the 80s and 90s, and I was trading crude and products in the 80s and 90s, so I had a long position when that happened, so I can remember it quite vividly. Um, prices crashed down to about 10 bucks. Consequences for the oil patch were catastrophic. Companies went bankrupt, they closed their doors, uh, and then, you know, just kind of similar to what happened last year, and then prices started to recover, uh, and then they traded in that same range for the most part for between 15 and 22 bucks for the next 14 years. The only exception there was Operation Desert Storm, where prices spiked briefly up to 40 bucks, and then they went back down. Well, after I showed this last year, a lot of people said, ah, that can't happen. The reasons why were a lot different than they were then, and so we've got to be dealing with a completely different scenario now. So we made a new slide. New slide looks like that. <laughs> people look at that and go, well, that could happen. Uh, prices staying in a $30 to a $70 range uh, for the next 14 years. Well, you know, anytime prices go high, then producers in the United States are going to start producing more, and the price is going to go back down. Anytime prices go back down, they're going to drill less, and prices are going to be go, go back up again. That could happen. And for those of you astute statisticians in the audience, you probably realize that that's no forecast at all. That's the numbers from the previous slide multiplied by three. And then people look at that and say, wait a second, is RBN forecasting a war in 2021? <laughs> Frank, isn't that about the time after the next election? <laughs> oh, I don't know. So I'll leave you with that. Frank said I could plug my book. There's my book. Thank you very much.
so nice do the math slide. Um, uh, two things, so, so Rusty, just to tee these up, because we want to go through the presentations, but on the oil side, because we had talked about the exports, and I think Kurt's going to talk about this too, so the quality of crude oil, right? So how much light oil versus what's heavier oil, what comes in, what's the economics of refined products, where does it go? And the replacement, and part of it that the U.S. surge of production even when the exports are limited, in fact, we both argued that the, the amount of uh, exports was going to be somewhat curtailed because what people need in the world, right? And we've, we're down in Libya, down in Nigeria, and we're still at like 600,000 barrels a day export. So the 3 million was questionable unless demand totally takes off. And I think um, Kurt will talk a little bit about that. But you also set this up terrifically for Sarah. Because this notion of the geo, <laughs> there you go, yeah. The geopolitical side of this is extremely important, depending what happens on policies, whether it's domestic infrastructure or border tax. On the gas side, you talked about where a lot of our exports go. What does that look like if refined products or natural gas doesn't go to Mexico, right? What if demand is curtailed because we have a trade war of some point, not even talking about conflict zones? And we've always thought that historically, the lowest cost production is conventional onshore. When you put up a map of where conflicts are, some of the conventional onshore places don't look like a good deal. And now that we're getting into a point where we've taken away technically complex, remote, high cost, offshore you know, frontier areas, we're setting ourselves up for, may not be 2021, but a surprise in prices or supply as we go forward. And then on the natural gas side, what happens on power generation and the clean power plant. So we're in this new space, and we have to reconfigure and just do a reset. But Sarah, I, we gave you a great introduction before you uh, got out of the cab. <laughs> Would love to see your presentation and look forward to hearing your remarks on geopolitics. Oh, okay. I didn't really prepare for geopolitics. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Frank, and all of CSIS for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I apologize for being late. Uh, I came from Boston and there was snow this morning. And when I got to the airport, uh, the uh, de-icer machine was not working at American Airlines. So <laughs> we sat there for quite a while. And I got up early to get an early flight. So, so anyway. Um, hey, Sarah, pull the mic down just a little bit. Pull the mic down oh, just a little sorry. bit. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, I don't have a, large, a, loud, a loud voice, so if you can't hear me, wave, and I'll, I'll speak louder. Um, you know, um, in preparing for this, it was my impression that I was going to focus a little bit more on what it took to get back to rebalance, um, as opposed to just specific geopolitics. So I've, I've prepared slides that are a little bit more numeric, but I'm very willing to talk and take questions on geopolitics. Uh, and uh, I've also, uh, unfortunately, I do have to forecast. Um, uh, that's what I do for a living. Um, so most of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to try to project into 2017 and 2018 um, in order to give a sense of the timing of a potential rebalance. Um, so uh, that, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll be there by the end of 2018, but I think we get a lot of progress. Okay, I'm going to move this down here. I don't think I need it. And I can't, I can't quite use my glasses. It's like they're not exactly the right thing, but we'll try here. Um, <clears throat> so does this just click? No. Yeah, there we go. OK. So. Uh, uh, originally, when I was asked to speak on something to do with rebalancing, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what is rebalancing. And I, I, I ask you to bear with me for just a few minutes as we sort of do a little bit of oil markets 101. Um, we're going to talk about numbers, because you can't get to rebalancing or some conclusion about rebalancing without looking at the supply and demand. Um, but I'm going to be talking about numbers that are annual averages. And I, I, I ask you to be flexible in your thinking about this, because annual averages take data and, and, and make them seem much more exact than they are, because it's a very fluid, fast-moving market. But annual averages are easier to chart, as you can imagine. Um, we're, we really talk about two different markets. And to understand whether we're in a, in a place of rebalance or not on a global scale, you have to look at both markets. Um, obviously, the one on the left, which is really crude oil supply and demand, that's pretty straightforward. It's covered a lot in the press. 
basically we look at you know, OPEC production, non-OPEC production, we compare it with things that are crude demand, which is refinery operations, strategic stocking, um, direct use of crude, which is very important in some countries. Um, I, I will mention also on the crude supply side, uh, field condensate or lease condensate, as I think it's called here. Uh, that number has gone up quite significantly, not just in the United States, uh, but in other countries, uh, specifically Iran. I also mention it because a lot of the growth in refining capacity in the last two years has been condensate splitters. So right there, we're, we're getting away from sort of, sort of typical crude oil definitions and getting into somewhat, somewhat more exotic crude oil supply. Um, the other side of the slide shows the other market that you really have to understand for market rebalancing, and I, I would argue it's probably the more important market in a way. Um, and that's really the market for petroleum products. Uh, supply of products comes from refineries and from other uh, 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 sources as well. Um, and if you think about that, oops, I don't really, this doesn't, there we go. So between these two markets are refineries, which are the top icon, and then you have gas processing plants, and then I've put a little leaf there. It's actually an apple tree leaf. I don't know why I picked that, but uh, that's biomass or fuels from alternative so sources. Um, and I've added into alternative fuels, um, uh, whoops. So it, including in alternative fuels is biofuels, uh, ethanol, but also gas to liquids, compressed natural gas, and coal to liquids, which is actually a fairly significant number, whoops. Um, in, uh, in China. So what we have here is we have this, this, this line between these two markets uh, that is uh, indicated by these sources of supply for the petroleum product markets. And it's really at that point, they really become a proxy for supply in a market for petroleum products, which is really where, we're, where we see the balance, really the important part of the balance. So what I want to talk to a little bit today is not just talking about OPEC and OPEC deals and non-OPEC you know, recoveries and all of that, because I think that's, it's pretty well covered in the press and in the trade press. And, uh, but how do we get to rebalance in the other market, which really is a little bit tr trickier to understand? So I'm going to start with the, the, the data that is best, which is really petroleum product demand, um, which uh, we collect data. All of the data you see today will be data that my firm collects. We collect it at the country level and organize it, and then project it uh, literally out 25 years. Whoops, wrong way. This is very touchy there. Here we go. So here's demand. Question is, where is demand growth? I mean, it's really easy for people to say, oh, it's Asia. Uh, and certainly Asia is the biggest part. That's the green bar. And I want to start just, let's use 2015 as an example. Uh, what you see there is uh, that's the growth in oil demand, uh, total oil demand, but that does not include strategic stocking, just total oil demand. So this is all the petroleum products. And you'll see that Asia had about a million barrels a day of, of growth in 2015. Interestingly enough, Europe had about 375,000 barrels a day of growth, which is extraordinary since Europe has been contracting. A lot of that's because the oil price fell to such a low level. Uh, obviously, the Middle East also had some, still some pretty hefty growth. Um, and if you look at the purple, which is at the bottom, that's North America, which is predominantly the United States, which also had very strong growth, a lot of that gasoline demand. So that's the, that's the year prices collapse, or, or they fall during the course of the year. 2016, then, is the year that, of, of low oil prices, that we've had low oil prices basically all year. Interestingly enough, demand growth really didn't accelerate. Um, it actually slowed down a bit. Europe slowed down a little bit, although still made a pretty impressive uh, growth. Asia slowed down from about a million to closer to 900,000. If you look, the purple line got very small, which is the U.S. number, predominantly the U.S. number. Uh, Latin America actually had a fairly negative number. And what happened here? Um, basically, we had a fairly significant reduction in diesel demand globally. Uh, most notable numbers is U.S. diesel demand went down, which those of you who follow EIA data, I'm sure you've seen that. Saudi Arabian de uh, diesel demand fell down. Other uh, Middle Eastern countries had diesel demand decline last year. Uh, and China had diesel demand decline, which is kind of interesting. Because, you know, for how many years did we talk, how many decades, I should say, did we talk about diesel as the engine of oil demand growth? Well, it's not anymore. It's a little bit of an orphan product. Um, and actually, when you look at that Asian number, the green one, uh, about 
almost 300,000, about 250, a little over 250,000 barrels a day of that was uh, liquefied petroleum gases, LPG, for petrochemical. And then there was probably another 50,000 of ethane. So what's happening here is the, um, uh, the sort of composition of oil demand is changing uh, among products. So let's, let's take a look, a little bit closer look at that. Whoops, gosh, I am really struggling here with this. Here. So here's the same chart, essentially, um, but I've divided it into the main products globally. And what you see here, um, just to, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a hint on this. So the green is gasoline demand growth. The orange is diesel demand growth. Um, the red is naphtha. But the blue and yellow, that's LPG and ethane demand globally. And you can see that the two together are beginning to compete uh, not only with diesel, but with gasoline as the fastest growers globally. And you think about it, there's a lot of logic to that if you think about it, because what's growing, you know, transport demand is kind of, it's not declining, but it's decelerating a little bit because of uh, econ fuel economy gains and pollution controls, at least up until uh, current administration perhaps. But, but, um, but it's also a, a case of where is growth still in Asia, and it's still in the petrochemical sector. So that's what we're seeing. Now, the other thing I put on this chart is it's one thing to talk about the product balance in aggregate when you're including ethane and LPG, which comes from natural gas liquids. It's a whole other story to talk about it in terms of refined product. Because remember, crude oil goes into refineries. So when we talk about the impact of an OPEC production or shale recovery, we're really talking about the crude that goes through the refining kit into the market. Because this natural gas liquids that feeds the ethane and LPG is coming from the gas market. All right? So what I've done here, I've put little, little uh, guidelines in to sort of give you a sense of this is demand for what you would call refined products. Demand for products that come from refineries is really the, the red down. So it's basically the naphtha, the gasoline, the jet fuel, diesel, and, and uh, fuel oil. And I've sort of deducted the LPG and ethane. Because we can't really look at this, uh, uh, suffi self su the sufficiency of petroleum product supplies if we don't understand the true demand. And let me also point out that when you see oil demand growth numbers in the press from a company like mine or EIA or IEA, and they talk about oil demand is going to grow at 1.3 or 1.4 or 1.5 million barrels a day, remember that includes the ethane and the LPG which is not really oil, or at least it's not made from oil. <laughs> okay, so the lines indicate, so if you just, I'll just give you a quick hint so you don't have to do the math yourself or try to read too closely here. So in 2014, uh, refined product demand growth was about 700,000. In 2015, it was 1.5 million. In 16, it was another 700,000. We're estimating it'll be about a million this year and about 900 next year. So. What do we know about how that's going to be supplied? OK, this is a complicated chart, but bear with me. So I got to it without any problem. Excellent. OK, this is how oil is supplied in our big, giant global market. As you can see, that black line is the demand line. OK, so that's, that's the top of all the other bar, uh, columns you saw in the last slide. And as you can see, Throughput, refinery operations, which is the, the sort of aqua blue, uh, supplies a lot of, supp of demand, but it doesn't supply all of it. You can also see from this that in 2014 and 2015, when you add up the NGL supply and all the refined product supply, we had way too much product globally. And that's why the bars are higher than the black line. Okay? So if we, again, try to... Forget about the NGLs for a moment. Forget about how we met the ethane and LPG demand and just talk about the refined product. Remember in 14, I said that the, uh, that the demand was about 700,000 barrels a day. Well, that surplus, the, if you take the throughput, which is the blue, and the red, which is alternative fuels, put them together, that's about 1.4 million barrels a day of supply, which means we had a surplus of 700,000 barrels a day of refined product 
including transport, all the pieces of transport fuels. In 15, we actually had 2.1 million barrels of supply when you add together what came out of the refineries and the things like ethanol, which means we had a 600,000 barrel a day surplus. So while we're talking about crude and OPEC and all of that, we've had this really dramatic increase in the availability of, of, of sources of supply of petroleum products, especially refined products. So now here we are in 16. And 16's been a really interesting year. I bet none of you really realize just how much the petroleum product markets are, are returning to rebalance already. And it, you certainly don't get that from the last few weeks of EIA data, uh, which has been really pretty dramatic uh, increases in inventories. But basically what happened, and, the, and these numbers are in the, they're in the, I mean, these are solid numbers. Refinery throughput, oil demand rose, we estimate, at about 1.3 million barrels a day. That's not, again, not including crude stocking in China. And refinery throughput only grew by 400,000 barrels a day. Alternative fuels kicked in probably about another 100,000 barrels a day. NGLs kicked in another couple hundred thousand barrels a day. And we're still well below demand. So what's begun, there has already begun a rebalancing in the product markets. It's just very hard to see in the relatively narrow OECD uh, inventory data that most people follow. So let's, uh, so basically what happens in 16 is you actually have a 200,000 barrel a day deficit in refined product. Just to save some time here, I've, I've put in, whoops, whoops. I just, I, the, I, these are sort of a cheat sheet. You can sort of see what happened. So we had a surplus in 14 of 700, a surplus in 15 of 600, a deficit of, in 2016 of 200, and we're estimating a deficit next year of also about 200. So the product markets have already begun rebalancing, although it's a little hard to see in the much quoted inventory data. So now, what happens next? And I, th I think uh, Kurt is going to talk much more about this, so I'm just going to briefly mention. You get into this market, and by 2018, we actually see this, this sort of a balanced market. But we've been, we've been working hard to claw our way back from a, a a, a surplus of refined product. And the thing that is concerning is that in 2018 and 2019, there are dramatic increases in refining capacity worldwide. And I think, I, and I mention this especially because when people talk about, well, how much crude should OPEC produce? Or how much crude could the U.S. export? They look at these refinery projects and they go, yay, look at that, awesome, we're going to sell all this stuff all over, we're going to sell it to Asia and the Middle Eastern uh, runs are going to go up, so that's going to divert crude that way. So, boy, this is, a, you know, this is a license to print money. But I think most of you know that some of this capacity either won't be used, won't be built, or will have to be offset by refining rationalizations elsewhere. And this is a big issue because just as we're getting towards rebalance, we have this tremendous investment in refining capacity hitting. So I worry a little bit that it's going to be hard for the product markets to fully get to rebalance. OK, so what are, I just want to leave you with all of that. It's a lot of numbers, but it's important because balance is not just about OPEC deals. But let's go back to crude because it's fun. So uh, I think OPEC's off to a good start. Uh, if the Saudi number for January is correct, uh, and they're actually down to something like 9.7 million barrels a day, then we've actually had a pretty significant drop in OPEC production. And I, I, I agree with J.R. Ewing, the uh, U.S. industry should be saying thank you. Um, now, but let's look outside of OPEC. What else is happening? So um, uh, Rusty put in some scenarios for production um, for the U.S. We actually see the U.S. up a bit next year, excuse me, this year, 2017. Um, I think our number is probably a little bit higher than EIA's, but not a lot higher. Um, and then we see U.S. production jumping by a little over 300,000 the following year. I think that's consistent with maybe the cutback scenario, something like that, and not quite the growth scenario. Whoops. Oh, shoot. There we go. So that brings us to the crude balance. We've talked a lot about petroleum products moving into a, a, a situation where they're rebalancing. 
The crude balance, as you can see, this is now a monthly chart as opposed to annual. Uh, and that, what that basically shows is global supply of crude minus global uh, crude demand, again, defined as throughput, stocking, et cetera. And what you see is the trend line, which is a black line, is showing that we're moving in the direction of balance after years of being really out of balance. But it's important to understand that the crude market rebalances in a weirdly seasonal way. There are dramatic swings in the seasonality of the crude balance. And right now, if you sort of look at the beginning few months of 2017, see that sort of surplus? That's, I mean, that's a pretty consistent uh, annual trend. So when you see these uh, weekly data, and I mean, it's amazing that the press goes nuts when they see the weeklies <laughs> because they say, oh my gosh, so much supply. And there's a reason why the market really hasn't come down because we should be having some crude stock, stocking going on right now. <clears throat> Perhaps it's a little faster than expected in the United States. Anyway, by 2018, you begin to see that the, we're back in balance, uh, at least on the crude side. So let's pot tie crude and products together because this is important. Um, let's see. Hello? There we go. All right. This looks like a complicated graphic, but it's actually not. And I know we're going to be passing all this out, so if you're welcome to peruse it later and ask me questions. Basically what this does is it shows the annual change in supply and demand each year. And you can see 2015 is a fun year to look at and sort of see why we got to low oil prices because you had, demand was up, it was over 2.2 million barrels a day, but non-OPEC supply was up a million, and OPEC was up almost one and a half million, and non-OPEC NGLs and alternative fuels were up about 500,000, and even OPEC NGLs were up about 100,000. Everything was up. Supply was really re remarkable. So it, it led to the decline in price. Then you look at 16, what happened in 16? We had this really tremendous decline in non-OPEC supply, and OPEC decided, you know, its strategy was to go for broke, increase production, and see what it could do um, in terms of uh, possibly maintaining or even growing its market share. And then magically in 2017, OP uh, OPEC has a shift in strategy. It decides that it's going to cut production. Demand is still shy of 1.5. Now, these demand numbers include Chinese crude stocking and Indian crude stocking. Non-OPEC supply is back up. Part of that's because Indonesia has shifted from the OPEC ledger to the non-OPEC ledger. Um, and uh, OPEC, non-OPEC NGLs are up as well. So what do they do? What OPEC has done is it's pulled the, the balance, which is the black line, finally into deficit. So this is tying everything together, the crude and the products, and you finally get into a deficit, a deficit that's already been emerging on products, deficit that's not quite there yet on crude. But by the annual average, by the end of the year, we'll, we'll be looking back at a, at a pretty strong deficit year. Oh, but there's one caveat, <laughs> and that is OPEC needs to sustain the, the deal through the second half of the year. If production starts going up from July on, uh, you, you, just, you can't sustain a deficit. All right, and then 2018, uh, it's just a projection. Basically what that says is if OPEC could keep production at 32.5 million barrels a day, they can keep the market balanced. That's in 2018. This is a tough place. This is a tough place for OPEC. Oil demand is not rising at a pace that OPEC can really start producing at will, in large part because countries like the United States will be increasing production. <clears throat> Okay, so some conclusions, and then I feel bad, Frank. I don't have a lot on geopolitics here, but I'm ready. Uh, okay, um, so th the way I, I'm, I'm, I'd like you to think about 2017 is I, I think it's one bright, shining moment. OPEC took the, took the tough decision to cut output. They yanked the Russians along. We can discuss that later. Um, the product rebalancing started in 2016. The crude rebalancing is now be underway with the OPEC cut. But as I said, there are two, but then, and then of course is the refining capacity uh, increases, which you know, on, on paper are enormous. Now, obviously that's not all gonna come to pass. Uh, global NGI supply sufficiency, it's a close call, but this is the thing about NGLs. They turn on and off really fast because you have these relief valves such as reinjection of ethane. Um, and then you have OPEC. So our conclusions, in a way, for OPEC are they, in order to maintain 
a market imbalance, which we think we're going to get to by the end of this year, they need to be very mindful of the supply because they are threatened all around. They're threatened by more refining capacity on the product side, possibly making those markets even sloppier or reversing the move towards a balance in the, in the product markets. Um, they are threatened by a slowdown in demand growth, which we've already seen. For any of you who follow China, it's fairly easy to pick up. Um, they're threatened by the fact that demand is not in products that come from refineries, but demand growth is in products that come from natural gas. And then finally, um, there's the threat of not more non-OPEC supply, which I think we're, we're going to see all kinds of increases. Not enormous in any one country, but a lot of small increases. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. So thanks, Sarah. So a couple of important points, right? So the difference between crude and products, and then between consumption and demand, because we'll get into the stock situation discussion too. One of the benefits of having Adam here for the last two days is we our offices are right next door, and so we tend to go sit and talk to each other at various times during the day. And we're coming out in the same places on a lot of things. But this whole notion about, so at the beginning of the year, great time for the Saudis to cut back. Refineries are going into turnaround. Don't need the supply anyway. Summer is the summer burn season. Do they ramp up? What does this look like after six months? And do we start seeing breakaway, right? Either fatigue or breakaway. Uh, does peace break out in Libya or Nigeria? Do we go south in Venezuela? So a lot of moving parts. So I, I know Adam will cover part of that, but we'll come back to the geopolitical pieces too. I want to turn now to Kurt, because this whole notion of, of refining what the investment has been like, what the product economics look like. So if you go back even two years, right? So gasoline in this country went from uh, negative $4 to positive $12 in terms of, of, of return on investment and what the margins look like. Distillate was positive 8 to positive 22. So if you're a refiner, what do you want to turn out? And it was distillate. What kind of crude matches your equipment, and where are you going to sell that? This notion of the, the border adjustment tax or what we sent to Mexico becomes big because as you look to increase U.S. production of both natural gas and refined product sales, Mexico is the logical place to send this stuff. But if we're not going to do that, what does that look like? So, Kurt, if you want to walk us through refinery investment and the competition that you see coming after Sarah teed up, what that investment looks like and where it is. Sure. No, th thanks, Frank. And I, I will say you've done an excellent job of setting this up. So I don't think I've been teed up quite, quite so well between two, uh, two previous speakers here. So um, but this is great. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk uh, about the refining uh, industry and our outlook, and I'll, I'll kind of walk us around some of the key world markets. When you do uh, get into the refining space, it does become a little more regional and local um, away from the, uh, the global balance, but uh, uh, we'll address that. Uh, yeah, I will say maybe a statement of the obvious, but the refining is a manufacturing business. Right? And as a manufacturing business, it is a margin business uh, that is the margin between the, the cost of those inputs and the, the revenue from those products sold. And you can see here uh, the, the, you know, this morning already, uh, there's been a lot of uh, change and uh, dynamics, if you will, in both sides of that equation, right? Um, and the refiners are trying to operate, respond, optimize, and invest. Um, with these various changes to their crude slates as well as, uh, you know, as well as the product uh, markets. I get this to work. So really kind of an introduction of, of kind of where we see things, what I'm going to talk about today, right, is after really a period of, of quite uh, volatile oil prices and, and shifts in the product demand and crude supply, uh, we're really moving into a, a phase that we've, uh, we've called the globalization of refining. Uh, and today we'll talk primarily about the globalization of the product markets. Uh, there, there's some globalization of cost structures and, uh, and, uh, and refining hub export centers that I won't get into much today. But it's this idea that uh, uh, we are trading and competing in the product markets on a much more competitive basis than we have before. And in fact, you know, today about three out of 10 barrels of product demand is traded internationally. 
right? So if you think about that, we're, we're almost a third of our products are, are competing in some way across international borders. And that's, that's having uh, very important implications for the refining uh, space, refining margins, refining investment strategies uh, going forward. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the big disruptor that we really see. It's a little bit farther out on the horizon, uh, four years out instead of uh, the, the, the next year or two. But uh, we'll see refining industry scramble uh, to try to um, try to get prepared prepared for that. So I'll talk um, um, just a little bit on demand side, uh, just to kind of set the context, and we'll talk some demand, some trade, and uh, you know, and some some refining margins. We did see um, you know a strong influence. Uh, in the U.S. market around VMTs, vehicle miles traveled, in, in response to the sharp price declines. And that really did catch uh, the refining system in the U.S. and really globally, uh, it kind of caught them back on, uh, on their heels because they were oriented and focused on those diesel margins that we talked about. And all of a sudden, we have all this gasoline demand. So the, you know, 2015 was a, it was a quite a year of reversal in terms of refining profitability and where those profits were made because you had the combination of, of a strong consumer demand, i.e. gasoline because of falling prices, really around the world, tempered a little bit by, by some of the subsidy uh, and, uh, and um, tax changes in some of the emerging markets, but, but really strong gasoline demand coupled with a time when we had some slowing uh, industrial output from the emerging markets, some slowing of, of industrial markets, which really put a drag on, on the diesel demand. And so that was uh, kind of where the, the, the refiners were really struggling to make enough gasoline. And as a result, they were overproducing diesel, and that's why we saw, that's really when we saw the transfer of the crude inventories that were oversupplied really into the distillate inventories globally. And, and we're still, uh, you know, we're still suffering from that uh, to, to to a degree. Uh, you know, the U.S. refiners have benefited uh, significantly from uh, the symbiotic relationship of, of the need for product uh, supplies and markets that have not invested in, in their own refining. Um, that's primarily, it, you know, for the U.S. refiners, Latin America, uh, to a lesser extent, Africa. Uh, those are two markets that, for various reasons, uh, we continue to see underinvesting in refining, and will continue to be, uh, you know, important in, import markets for, for U.S. refiners. As we mentioned, you know, Mexico is a uh, very important trade partner, um, and the, the majority of that gasoline to Latin America goes goes into Mexico, which raises some some interesting questions uh, when you start talking about uh, you know some of the tariff and trade. Uh, discussions going on inside the Beltway here and, and and across the border, you know, Pad Three refineries now. You know, the, the Pad Three refining system is really an international uh, refining system now, very competitive in part because of the low price natural gas, also uh, the lower lower cost feedstocks that, that we'll talk about. But around 20 percent of the output uh, production of, of the refining system in Pad Three now uh, goes out by water uh, internationally. So um, U.S. refining uh, margins you know, were quite strong in, uh, in, in 14, 15, stabilized, I'd say, in, in 2016. And why we haven't had large volumes of export of U.S. crude, um, it has had implications for the refining sector. And that is in we, we've reestablished this spread between sweet refining and sour refining. Okay. And so traditionally, if you go back kind of before the boom in uh, oil production in the U.S., and when we were essentially um, importing all of our crude oils, um, or marginally all crude oil grades, I'd say, importing sweet crude into the Gulf Coast, you saw this, this uh, um, kind of s s um, typical refining situation where you know, that LLS cracker, so that's light Louisiana sweet crude on the Gulf Coast, cracking refinery configurations. That, that is essentially the lowest, um, simplest complexity of, of refining kit that the U.S. has to make refined fuels, okay? You know, and, and there, there's a much 
higher level of investment required to, to move from that sweet cracking up into sour processing to handle uh, the sulfur and other contaminants and the lower quality of those sour crudes. And then also here I've showed uh, Mars. So Mars is a medium sour uh, crude oil operating in a, in a coking configuration. And you can see that effectively, you know, before the opening of the crude oil ban in, in late 15, those margins were very similar to each other, which was, which is, uh, was quite abnormal from a, a refining perspective and, and thinking about the extra cost, capital, and resources invested in that coking refinery versus uh, uh, you know, a sweet cracking refinery. And that was really a direct result of the fact that we could not export the light tide oil volumes uh, that, that we were producing inside the U.S. That's completely reestablished itself now, and, and we think stays, stays going forward. That also has implications for the appetite for U.S. refiners to invest in more light sweet uh, capacity, right? Because the margin on that right now is right around zero, right? And with an export, with the free unfeathered exports, um, it's, it's more difficult to envision that there's actually a lot of profit to be made in, in light sweet processing of crude oil. So there are situations where it will make sense, but sitting on the Gulf Coast, it, it's more challenging now because you can effectively get a, a higher value into the international, international market. Pad one refineries of, of all the pads inside the U.S. have probably been the most impacted, you know, positively then, you know, now, now less so um, from, the, uh, from, the high, from the crude oil production re revolution that we've had here. So I'm showing here really the pad one crude slate, very simplified crude slate in terms of where they source that, that those crudes. You can see you know, the, the swelling of the domestic sweet supplies. You know, that was primarily the logistic systems that were put in to rail uh, Bakken crude oil in, into the East Coast. A little bit of that comes in by water uh, fr from, the, from the Gulf Coast region, but mo most of that is rail. And you can see now as we've opened up the mid-continent logistics systems, as we've opened up the crude oil uh, exports out of the U.S., and, and to a degree, the oversupply in crude oil markets globally is creating a, a more competitive landscape for crude supply. And we're seeing, you know, odd shipments of, of crude, you know, Brent trading into Asia, um, you know, Tr crude trades that you would not normally see. That's also a function of low freight rates uh, that, that allows you to, to, to freight those into in, into markets. But it's a it's a much more competitive market for crude supply into refineries as well as as well as the product supply that that we'll talk about. So if we move, if we kind of think about the U.S., the U.S. has grown a little bit in capacity um, and uh, and has this nice export market that it's tied into uh, with Latin America and, uh, and, and is in a pretty competitive position, um, you know, sweet crude economics uh, aside. Different story when you get into Europe, right? So Europe is, is, a, is, a, is a much more mature market, a much more um, uh, market that's being Push from a lot of different sides, particularly from the diesel, uh, the di diesel import side, and, uh, and and has not had the advantages of the U.S. Uh, supply side fundamentals in low price gas and and, and lower price. Uh, lower price crudes. We do think there's some additional rationalization that, that will occur uh, in Europe, uh, but there's also some factors around the IMO that, that we'll come back and talk about that may uh, delay or stay the execution, if you will, uh, on, on, on some of that capacity rationalization that, that we need. You know, we have been uh, closing refineries. Um, we've closed, you know, roughly this is uh, the worldwide closures uh, over the last nine years or so. So we've, eight or nine years, so we've closed close to a million barrels a day of, of capacity. Much of that has been in Europe. Um, you know, a lot of press about, uh, you know, difficulty closing refineries because of labor contracts and so forth. But we have, you know, we have rationalized some capacity there. We've rationalized a, a, a little bit in the U.S., some in other OECD markets. And it's really, if you look at where people are investing and the companies are investing, uh, if you look at like the majors, for example, they're really pulling back, selling, um, not exiting refineries in most cases, but uh, exiting their weaker assets, but then going in and reinvesting growing, expanding, enhancing, integrating with petrochemicals, their more sophisticated uh, refining uh, uh, locations, right? So they're building, not really shrinking capacity uh, uh, 
in, in total in all cases, but um, I'd say uh, coming back to their, their home markets in, in, in some ways. European refineries are quite weak uh, margins. You know, they benefited, um, you know, from the higher diesel uh, markets, you, you know, that we talked about. But for the most part, we think, you know, the European margins are going to be under pressure really as, um, as those import markets competition from Russia, uh, which supplies diesel in there. We've got the U.S. Uh, um, Gulf Coast that can supply that, that market. And then the new um, supply that's really putting competitive pressure both east and west globally is the diesel supplies and to a lesser degree the gasoline supplies that are coming out of some of these new Middle East uh, you know startup export uh, export refineries and that's um, you know a little hard to, um, to, to, to overemphasize or to, to exactly graphically uh, uh, show, but just consider for a minute um, the diesel, ultra low sulfur diesel, some of the trades and arbitrages that, you know, that, you know, that we're seeing today and how those, how those have shifted. So you know, what we've seen is that the Middle East now is supplying roughly a quarter of the imports into Europe. You know, that's up from something that was uh, well less than 10% just a few years ago. And the structure uh, that they're going to export less feedstocks and fuel oil but in many ways, those exports of high-quality, ultra-low sulfur diesel and gasoline will, will stay at the doorstep of, uh, of the European refiners. What we're seeing, actually, is a, a case where we call the flip-flop, right? So where now we've pushed down the diesel prices, ultra-low sulfur diesel in particular, in Europe, low enough to where Europe can almost export diesel out of, um, out of Europe into New York Harbor, right? And this week, we're seeing cargoes of, of gasoline in New York Harbor being loaded and, and exported to Africa. Um, the ARB that we normally thought was available to ship diesel you know, out of the US Gulf Coast Pad 3 into Europe is essentially closed now. Um, so that's, it, it's, a, uh, it's a reflection of the competitiveness and, and to some degree the flattening of the price landscape that we've got in the product markets right now because of the oversupply, again, particularly in the diesel markets, low freight rates, um, and, uh, and, and, and so any uh, change in crude price or competitive advantage is, you know, is quite important today in the, uh, in, in the product side of, of the refining markets. And then in Asia, you've got these Middle East flows from Middle East and India that are really colliding with, uh, you know, with the, the, the China exports. And that's, that's the key question, really, that we get asked a lot is, you know, what's going to happen with China, right? And so China's been in, the, in a focal point of the oil markets, you know, for many, many years for, for obvious reasons. Now, the question on the refining side is, you know, will China become a sustained growing exporter of refined products? You know, Lord knows they, they export everything else. Uh, why not, why not re refined products? A number of reasons kind of why we don't think that stays long term, some changes in how the independent refinery um, uh, taxes are, are, getting, are getting looked at. There are, we're seeing a pullback of the national oil company investment plans uh, for refining. And at the end of the day, we think the Chinese uh, uh, government and NOCs really want self-sufficiency. They want to be able to produce uh, the products for their own market, but not necessarily uh, you know, become a, a a big export center, and we're not sure the economics are really there uh, on a uh, non um, non subsidized basis to really compete uh, globally. But it's putting, you know, it's flattening that landscape, uh, it, it, if you will. So just a slide or two here. Um, um, I guess I will get into geopolitics uh, a, a little bit. I mean, we've you know, the new administration. Um, a lot of questions around, uh, you know, where this goes and, and how this influences our, our, our industry. Short term, you know, it's a stimulus, right? So the spending, um, the removal of regulations um, is, is good for demand in the short term. But there's uncertainty longer term in how the, uh, the international market reacts to some of the trade, tariff, foreign policy uh, actions and, uh, and uh, statements. 
you know, cafe, climate change, alternatives, those are uh, probably positives. Uh, but you know, the rising debt, lower lower trade is um, you know something that uh, the, the refining industry thinks about as as many industries do. We've been doing a little bit of work thinking about the border tax and how that how that plays through. Clearly, uh, it's a stimulant for the upstream part of the business, raises uh, you know the price of uh, oil at, at the wellhead, also raises the price at the pump, most likely, as, as we understand it. That'll obviously have uh, you know some impact on demand, although there's the price demand elasticity in the U.S. market uh, long term is, is not what it used to be. Um, but on the refining side, because the refining industry is very connected with the international markets, uh, where you have free flow of crude and products back and forth across that border, uh, we don't really see the the uh, refining margin really being impacted in a big way. We really don't see a, a change in the crude slate or the incentive to run an imported versus a, a, a domestic barrel because of the way that tax, uh, you know, we, we believe that tax, you know, will flow through. Um, they're more impacted really by the RFS, CAFE, um, and, um, and gasoline octane requirements, which are also policy uh, topics that are being uh, being discussed and, and, and debated. It's been for the U.S. refining industry. I mean, first of all, it's taken away 10 percent of their demand. Um, it's, uh, you know, caused uh, a significant amount of investment needed in order to create an infrastructure to deliver the ethanol into uh, into the terminaling system. And, and in, in more recent years, the, the RFS, REN, um, credit system has created significant differences between different refinery marketing companies, depending on how much integration downstream with marketing they have, how much blending those refineries are doing downstream is creating, you know, just, just very large disparities uh, between different refining companies in terms of their actual cost to comply. Um, it's a quite complex um, policy. Um, with you know ag autos and oil um, all at the table and um, there's been a lot of changes in technology and uh, costs and if, if that is reopened um, you know it's hard telling exactly where that policy might go or ha how um, how the debate might evolve so uh, oh, and then the big one, the, the, the big storm. I'm oh, sorry, I said I'd uh, talk about the big storm on the horizon. IMO bunker fuel, right? So IMO bunker fuel regulations reducing sulfur of, um, of ship fuel from 3.5% down to half percent. It's only about 4% of product demand, um, but it's an overnight change. Uh, so it's 4 million barrels a day, overnight change, the most difficult uh, molecules inside the refinery to process. Um, Neither the shipping nor the refining industry is ready for this, and the way the regulations or rules are, 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 are written, there's different compliance paths that the shipping industry or the refining industry can take, so it's not clear uh, exactly um, you know, who's going to move first or, or which ships are going to put on equipment or, or which refineries are, are going to supply the fuel. Um, we think it's quite impactful for light, heavy, and sweet, sour price relationships because you know, when we do the analysis on the balance of, of that resid, right, so this is the very heavy, um, you know, road, road asphalt type material that has to be disposed of, it really pushes that down into the power sector um, and, and requires a price discount that's, that's, you know, very, very significant relative to, to oil prices uh, and, and creates this, this huge uh, expansion of light heavy refining margins. Um, but it's transient, right? It, it's something that will happen for a few years. The shipping industry will respond, put on scrubbers, we'll have other uh, responses. So it's very difficult for the refining industry to invest, um, you know, billions of dollars to capture uh, a few years of strong margins. All right, I probably took too much time. Thanks, Frank. Kurt, thanks much. So actually one of the things I was going to talk about was the bunker fuel change and you hit it on slide 37. God love you. Um, but it's also this notion on just from a security standpoint, if Europe uh, rationalizes refining capacity, they become more product dependent on, on 
refined product coming from the Middle East or Asia, what does that do to the geo geopolitical piece? Uh, and now I'm going to turn to Adam, and I will tell you just sitting here, right, so the rest of us are looking at slides, and Adam is looking at tables of data, and this is why it's going to work so well. So Adam Siminski. Well, Frank, thank you very much, and thank you for that very, very kind uh, introduction. I, I can't uh, say enough about how delighted I am to be part of the uh, Energy and National Security program here at uh, CSIS. It has taken me a bit of time to, 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 realize. to, to realize that we is now CSIS instead of EIA, uh, but, uh, but uh, what, a, uh, what a wonderful opportunity this is. Um, I, I, you know, at the, at the risk of dragging things out a little bit, I want to thank a few people, uh, including you, Sarah Ladislaw, um, and Guy Caruso, who's uh, here in the front of the room despite his, uh, his knee injury, <laughs> and, and uh, others in the program, Jane uh, Nakano, Ed Chow, who's not uh, here today, Lisa uh, Highland, and, and Ian Barrow. Ian was the guy coming up making the slides work. Uh, without um, all of the all of the people like that, uh, programs like this really don't um, get underway. Uh, the support that the energy program gets from John Hamry, the president of CSIS, is extraordinary, and, uh, and I'm delighted about that too. And then we have all kinds of affiliates and, uh, and associates, and, and it's a great thing. So here's what I wanted to do, I, and I promise I'm gonna do this really quickly. I just wanna run through what I thought I heard from uh, Rusty, Sarah, uh, and Kurt. And what Rusty said is technology is still advancing in shale uh, production. Uh, that supplies are gonna be robust under most of the scenarios that he investigated and that price volatility or uncertainty, however you wanna look at it, is, is inescapable. Um, you know, at, at EIA, uh, we used this reverse Black-Scholes equation to try to express some of these things. It's not as, as fun as the way uh, Rusty explains it, but basically what it says is, look, we can give you 95% certainty of what crude oil prices are going to be over the next 18 months. 95% certainty, somewhere between about $25 and $100 a barrel. So, uh, Sarah, uh, I, I think actually had what sounded to me like the hints of the most bullish of the presentations at the table, hints. Um, you know, she look, I thought it was kind of interesting. Diesel and ethane demand looks like it's rising. There's a recovery going on into 2017 and 18. The other products looked stable enough. So the product markets are rebalancing. It's underway. And OPEC is off to a good start, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, but the conclusion really is that global, the global balancing trend clearly on a good track uh, into 2015, 16, uh, and 17. Maybe kind of like not, not quite as clear what the direction would be in 2018, but an opportunity, I think, for a bit more stability in, in pricing. Um, Kurt, when he looked at the refining markets, I mean, it seemed to me that the message there was it's become a global uh, business. So refining used to, refineries always were located where the consumers were, right? You didn't want to have to move the product very far. And, and that's really different now, right? We're putting refineries in all kinds of places, uh, in India, for example, and those products are going all over the world. And in the United States, we're now exporting uh, not just crude, uh, that, that I, Rusty, I think actually in the latest um, EIA numbers, the crude export numbers took a little bit of a jump, and I think in, in January. So it's kind of an interesting one. But let me come back to just some EIA numbers. Um, the, ex, the U.S. is on a net basis in the products market, net basis, exporting uh, 900,000 barrels a day of distillates, a half a million barrels a day of gasoline, 400,000 barrels a day of uh, other fuels. Um, and, and including hydrocarbon gas liquids. So we're really seeing the U.S. penetrating the global hydrocarbon gas liquid market. That could be an interesting one to see some surprises developing. But the U.S. has become a, a huge player in the global uh, refining markets. Um, and what Kurt said was that globalization is leading to competition. I think that's what the U.S. numbers are telling you. 
and that competition could lead to margin pressure and that margin pressure could lead to upsets. Um, Kurt called them disruptions. Um, policy uncertainties could certainly play a role. Um, Sarah Ladislaw uh, has put together, uh, you know, some thoughts on, on how the Trump administration uh, might uh, work in the, in the energy markets, and it, it was almost more of a, a thing that's hard, gonna be hard for, uh, I think, analysts to track, because it's not so much it's all driven by ideology or it's even all driven by the uh, desire to fix something, but more on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, you know, sort of what would make sense to him and to his vision for America uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, and, and the criteria used to judge those cases could change from, from item to item. So that's going to make things interesting. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with just a few thoughts. That I, I, Frank saw me looking at the numbers. I can't help myself. I love numbers. <laughs> um, the, uh, I thought it would be interesting just to, to just do a quick review of some of the thoughts from both EIA, the IEA, and OPEC on global economic growth. So everybody is really looking for global economic growth to pick up between 2016 and 2017. Uh, and 2018, it's a little bit more of a mixed picture, but EIA has global economic growth looking actually pretty strong going out into uh, 2018. As a consequence, EIA has uh, one of the strongest global oil demand uh, figures uh, growing at 1.6 million barrels a day in 2017 and still another 1.5 million barrels a day in 2018. Uh, the other numbers are more, and, and Sarah showed some numbers for 2018 as well, more uh, like uh, 1.2 to 1.4 million barrels a day. But, but interestingly, those demand numbers look fairly robust in most people's views of the economic outlook. And I, I know that, that recently it's been the supply side that has really been driving a lot of thinking. What's happening to shale when it went up and then when it went down? What's OPEC doing in terms of the cuts, and are they complying or are they not complying? But underneath all of that is this, what appears to be a fairly decent outlook for global economic growth uh, that could turn into a bit of a surprise, possibly a positive surprise that would help that rebalancing uh, to take place. Um, one of those conversations that Frank and I had just uh, the other day uh, when we were uh, thinking about the rebalancing in the global oil markets is the role of four key countries, Iran, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, and now Russia uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, OPEC um, uh, ceiling uh, scenario. Um, Iran and Iraq came to the table Russia came to the table. There seems to be, you know, the last two times that Russia promised that they would do something, they really didn't. Uh, there was a lot of skepticism about Russia, and there may still be in the current um, uh, OPEC agreement, uh, but President Putin and Russia seems to be uh, committed uh, to having the Russian companies do something. And uh, so Russia's numbers are not as great as they had like been assigned in a sense, or what they agreed to at the meeting uh, in Vienna, uh, but uh, they are moving uh, in a, a reduced production uh, direction. Uh, there's going to be a compliance uh, committee, OPEC compliance committee meeting in late March, and I think that one of the interesting things in, that we were thinking about was how are the Saudis going to view this? Are uh, countries like Iran and Iraq uh, and, uh, and Russia uh, doing enough to uh, make the Saudis feel comfortable that, that the rebalancing uh, is likely uh, to preserve uh, some kind of stability in prices, or are they going to be unhappy? And Frank already indicated there are some uh, wild card countries out there, uh, Libya and Nigeria, where production could go up, or Venezuela, where production could go down. Uh, that could uh, have a significant impact on this decision that the Saudis are going to have to make. Uh, so I think that there's uh, going to be plenty to uh, keep us, uh, uh, everybody, 
that looks at the oil and natural gas markets busy uh, over the course of the next uh, six months or a year. Um, the, uh, the level of changes uh, that are taking place uh, across a number of the areas that I've already discussed, I think, is, is fairly significant. And uh, so I'm, I'm back to this point of surprises might be, might be the, the word of the year uh, that we could be surprised. Uh, and here's the problem. We don't know whether those are positive or negative. <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, that's an advertisement to come back to the next meeting that we'll be having <laughs> uh, here at uh, at my new home at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you, Frank, and, and to our panelists. And he already knows how to pitch. This is going to work out <laughs> fine. All right, so I promised you we're going to do a couple of questions. So we'll take three, and then we'll combine them, and then we'll let it go through. So we'll take it up here. We have uh, three quick reels. Come on, uh, Suzanne. So um, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and you can make a comment, but pose your question in the form Agnia of Agnia Griguez, Atlantic Council. Um, author of a new book, The New Geopolitics of Natural Gas, and my questions on the gas markets. Um, I wanted to ask the panel, you know, in last year we saw U.S. LNG exports go across the globe, uh, Latin America, Asia, Europe. Are you as optimistic for 2017 or perhaps even more optimistic in terms of the volumes of uh, uh, U.S. LNG exports? Thank you. Okay. And Sarah? Thank you. Uh, Sarah Jordan. I'm a faculty member at Johns Hopkins SAIS. Uh, first, I'd like to say that I really enjoyed all the presentations, so thank you very much. Uh, my uh, first question is actually a quick one for Rusty and then a, a broad one for all of you. Um, in terms of uh, decline curves, clearly they depend a lot on the assumptions of well lifetime. So the changes, and, and of course with your experience, it would be really nice to hear a discussion on uh, w how that discussion has changed because it was quite controversial at the onset of the shale gas revolution up until now, particularly with the changes, uh, the steps up in terms of initial production. Uh, and more broadly, it would be really great to hear all of you discuss uh, or comment on the changes of, of, uh, in price volati volatility pre and post shale gas revolution and how that has changed with respect to your presentations. Okay, uh, third question. Great. Hi, uh, Jack Anderson with FTI here in DC. Um, my question I suppose is directly at Kurt, uh, but feel free to chime in if you have opinions as well. I'm um, wondering with Aramco planning to go public in the next year or two, if you think that'll affect uh, their plans for um, expanding in the downstream and refining areas of their business and also what kind of impact that could have on the industry as a whole. Thank you. So Frank, before, before you uh, go to the, the three questions, can I add a fourth? Um, I got a tweet from Bill Witsit, who's now the uh, head of the Greater Montana Foundation, and he says he's looking out his windows at Flathead Lake in, uh, in northern uh, Montana. And he doesn't get And he's got a question for Rusty, and it's, what are, those imp what's, what are the implications of the ri rising decline curve for U.S. energy security and exports? Okay. All right. So we'll start with those, and uh, we actually talked about the, the timing of the IPO. What does that do if you're Saudi Arabia sitting in June or July of 2017, right? So, okay. All right, so we can start with a gas question, unless, Russell, you want to start with Witsits? Uh, well, I mean, it, uh, a, a less steep decline curve is really good for, uh, for energy <laughs> security. I mean, that seems pretty obvious to me. Um, in terms of kind of tying that back to the other question, though, of what does that mean for the long term, for the life of the well, we don't really know, right? Because we haven't seen it. But at least the, uh, the at least the, the the folks that I've talked to that are supposed to know this sort of thing, the geophysical folks, indicate that if I've choked back on my initial production, that means the hydrocarbons are still down there, right? And the way those frac jobs are being done now, even if you don't get all the hydrocarbons out with the first frac job, you just come back in with the second one. Now, I'm vastly oversimplifying this whole thing, but if the hydrocarbons are there, stringing them out longer will be good for well economics. It'll be good for energy security, and you know it'll be uh, it'll just be good for producers in general. Kurt, you want to answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So no, I think um, 
you know, even even um, on the decline curves we had like two years ago, right? You, we saw these very steep declines, but what we were seeing, as you look at the total play, is that they were they are flat. They do flatten out and um, and um, uh, flatten out the uh, uh, and so you what we saw is that you really do kind of build a base there, right? Um, and that was actually part of. Um, the way the math worked and why we didn't see the, the slowdown as fast as we thought we might have when the price declined, right? So we, were, we stopped drilling the wells and we, we lost those initial productions, but we, we actually had a base there, right, that carried us, that, that carried us through. So I think, um, you know, I agree, I, I agree we haven't seen exactly how this uh, uh, plays out, but I think the, the life of the well, um, you know, has, has some, um, some, some room to run. Yeah, so uh, two thoughts on that. So Marshall Nichols, uh, we went up to the Marcellus and actually took our staff up here because I thought they needed to do a field look at, at fracking. And one of the things on the supply curves, the company that we were visiting, they had showed the steep decline and then the flatten out. Then they showed a second set of slides where the decline wasn't nearly as steep and the tail went longer. And, and I remember sitting there going, huh, they're manipulating the well. And so you, know, you raise your hand and it's like, so what's going on? It's like, well, yeah, we choked it back because there was no place to put it. So this notion of, of choking back on, on the data, you really have to go in basin by basin, field by field, and look at the economics and totally agree. But we are now seven or eight, nine years into some of this stuff. So early on, people were making assessments that the um, productivity increases were great, but that also meant your recovery rates were great. And at that time, you clearly couldn't say that. We're starting to get to the point, as, as we look at these things over a longer time frame, what that really means for ultimate recovery, right? So, and, and with the technology, um, we've got Bob Kleinberg here who may want to comment on this as well, but the whole technology, so part of it, it's we have a, clearly a better understanding of the reservoirs and what we're doing. Second point is that with a conventional well, you do enhanced recovery. With a fracked well, you have to go refrack it, right? And then third piece is how much of this is horsepower, more sand, more water, longer laterals, and how much is it a better understanding of the geology, and it's probably a combination of both. Yeah, but uh, EOGs, uh, you know, come out with a thing right. where they they are doing enhanced recovery on fracked wells, so yeah. don't think that the don't technology be, yeah, right. is I not going to be ahead of all of us. I totally agree. Kurt, did you want to make a comment on OPEC downstream strategy? Yeah, sure. So. Um, Interesting question, right? So, you know, Saudi Aramco has been um, an active investor and uh, had a, a global portfolio for some some period of time, right? Um, Asia, U.S., and others. And I, I don't think it made any secret that uh, you know they're wanting to expand in the in the U.S. market, and um, and I think that we will continue to see them, you know, become more of a global player in the in in the downstream global global space, right? Um, and the uh, the IPO is uh, you know. An extension of that, if you will, right? But I, I would expect to continue to see them uh, play play an active role, right, and diversify, really their um, yeah you know, their energy space. Okay, we had a question on on global gas exports, both from a security standpoint and also on competition. And Sarah, you want to take was a shot it, at was that? Was it natural gas or NGLs or LNG? No, LNG. LNG. Okay. Um, Mi microphone. Microphone. Um, I think we are like many people watching each of the plants that are being built and or expanded. And I think our numbers sort of top out at something like, uh, it's probably in the order of 10 BCFD as a top. So the question is, where does it go? And there are other capacities being built elsewhere. I don't mean to sound too conservative or pessimistic, but it's a, it's a fairly um, competitive market in natural gas or in LNG as well. So. I tend not to be in the hockey hockey stick view on this one. We're getting very close. Adam Rusty, you come. Uh, just uh, uh, on exports, um, a part of it depends, of course, on what happens to the price of crude oil, right? If crude oil, price, crude oil prices are high, there'll be a higher demand for LNG, or if crude oil prices are low, there'll be a lower one. So everything, uh, everything gets impacted by price. Uh, Adam, you mentioned something about exports are up a little bit lightly on crude oil. So I talked to several of the people that are actually involved in that trade right now. 
It doesn't have anything to do with crude or condensate. It has everything to do with the WTI versus Brent spread. And if the WTI Brent spread goes above 250, we're going to export more. And if it goes less, we're going to export less. And the rest of the supply demand balance doesn't have a whole heck of a lot to do with it, at least right now. That's true. You want to talk about LNG? Uh, so on LNG, uh, last fall, uh, Capsarc had a, uh, that's the Saudi um, Research Center uh, in Riyadh, had a, a meeting here in Washington on LNG. And the general conclusion there, and I think Sarah kind of hit on this, was that the markets are pretty well supplied in the period out to uh, the early to mid-20s, actually. And uh, after that, um, open up a bit more. So I think that there's a, a period where there's probably going to be a lot of competition uh, on the gas side. Keep in mind that, that still, in most of the world, um, LNG prices are really tied into oil prices. Um, not true in the United States, but it's certainly true in much of the rest of the world. And uh, as a consequence, what happens in the oil markets, and we've had a lot of discussion about that uh, can really have a meaningful, meaningful impact on LNG and how much gets exported and consumed. Uh, one of the interesting questions, I guess, would be, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of some of the things that were said here, Kurt's point uh, that uh, Frank highlighted, uh, the changes in sulfur regulations for ships, if that really creates uh, extra amounts of, of uh, fuel that could be used by utilities, uh, there could be competition for uh, either coal or, or LNG in, in the global power market. So it would be an interesting question to see how some of that works out. And I, and I think on the policy side, um, I believe a lot of people uh, thought that, uh, that LNG was going to play a very strong role in helping a number of countries meet uh, agreements under the Paris uh, climate. Mm -hmm. Uh, plans and how far that's now going to go is one of those policy questions that uh, th that we're all struggling with. And the infrastructure piece is also important, right? We haven't seen a lot of opposition, of well, some opposition to natural gas pipelines as opposed to oil pipelines, but that could be coming as well. So I've got to tell you, every time we have one of these sessions, they're always content rich with these kind of panels. <laughs> But at the end of it, you feel like you've scratched the surface and you've opened up a whole new slate of questions and issues you want to discuss further on, which tees up Adam's point, our new team member, um, that you need to come back here for further discussions. And if you'll join me in thanking this wonderful panel, and thank you for your attention and patience.